Hey everybody, Pastor Scott here. And on behalf of Pastor Sexton and everybody at the Worship Center, we'd like to thank you for viewing. If you're from our viewing area, we'd like to invite you to our service Sunday morning at 1045. We are located at 420 Cardinal Drive in Bourbon, Illinois, and we would love the opportunity to connect with you. If you have Twitter, follow us at My Worship Center or go to our website, myworshipcenter.net. There you can view the Worship Center replays, see our upcoming events, and learn more about our ministries. Whether you are homesick, working, or watching from a long distance, it's our prayer that you will be uplifted and encouraged. Thank you, and we hope to see you soon. I could not go on without him, I know. This world would overwhelm my soul. I could not see the right way. When temptation o'er me rolls, He whispers sweet peace to me. He whispers sweet peace. When I am cast down and troubled in soul, He whispers sweet peace to me. He speaks in a still small voice we're told it's a voice that dispels all my fears and when I am cast down and troubled in soul that steel small voice I hear He whispers sweet peace to me Yes, He whispers sweet peace to me When I am cast down and troubled in soul, He whispers sweet peace to me. sweet peace to me. I want you to stand, if you would, and open your Bible this morning to the book of Isaiah, and then we're going to be going to the book of Matthew, Isaiah chapter 7. It's good to see all of you out today. Glad that you're here. Those of you that are viewing on Facebook and uh, on the internet, thank you for being with us today. Wish you could be with us today, but uh, at least you're joining us there. We're so glad that you are. Thanks for being with us today. And uh, all of you, my, you know, uh, just take a look at this great number that's here today. Yeah, uh, I'm looking around. I'm seeing people. Amanda's seeing bake sale sales. <laughs> She's seeing cookies flying out the door after for the youth group today. Thank you for being with us today. 
Uh, I want to preach, uh, begin our Advent series this morning with a very familiar passage of Scripture. I am probably not going to preach anything new to you today that you haven't already heard at some point. But I don't really think that that is, that's the point of it all. I think sometimes we just need to remember and be reminded again of the story of Jesus and how he came into this world. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now join me, if you would, in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 1, beginning in verse 18. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But when he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So all of this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophets, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated is God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son and called his name Jesus. Father, in the name of your son Jesus, we pray that you would give uh, inspiration, anointing uh, to this message today. Touch hearts and touch lives is my prayer today. Father, someone here that needs to hear from you today, God, would you speak to them through your words today, God? And we will give you the praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now look over at your neighbor and say, neighbor. Oh, you can do better than that. Neighbor. Oh, neighbor. Preacher needs your help. All your amens. Today's subject, what's in a name? Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord today. Shakespeare wrote, what's in a name? A rose by any other name would smell as sweet. Name by any other name, would, it would still be a rose. I'm sure you've heard that phrase before. <clears throat> in scripture, names mean something. Names carry great impact in the Bible. The name Isaac means laughter. Uh, for when God announced that Sarah would have a child in her old age, you better believe she laughed. <laughs> and she named the child laughter. She named him Isaac. The name Jacob means trickster, one who supplants, one who undermines. The name Abram means exalted father, but his name was changed to Abraham, which means the father of many nations. The name David means one who is beloved. The name Goliath actually means splendor. I mean, think about it. What a, what a splendor, uh, what, a, what a splendid specimen of a man he was. Nine feet, nine inches tall, 450 pounds. Goliath, splendor. Names meant something in the scripture. Years ago, parents would name their children after someone significant in their lives. They would name their daughters after their great-grandmothers. They named their sons after great presidents and great leaders. Children were given great names because names mean something. Names bring up identity. Names bring up family history, family background. Sometimes in Scripture, parents name their children not because of what they were, but because of what they hoped that they would become. We see also in Scripture names like Peter. Peter was not always Peter, was not always Petra. His name was Simon, but Jesus saw something in him and renamed him Peter, Petra, a rock. 
What's in a name? There were other children born that year that was named Jesus. Uh, Because if you understand, you will understand that Jesus was a rather common name in Hebrew times and Jewish customs. It was the Hebrew name Yeshua or Joshua. But this name, this child was named because of his birth, because his birth was unique. His birth was different. He was the only begotten son of the father. Now, when when you read the prophecy in Isaiah and and relate it to the fulfillment that we see in Matthew, there is a scriptural paradigm that's uh, always being placed whenever prophecy has been exegetically explained. There is first revelation, and then after revelation, there comes a human response. The response is sometimes incredulity. The, The response is sometimes humble obedience. But whatever the response is, whenever a revelation is made, there is always a human response. After the revelation, after the response, comes the scriptural fulfillment that ratifies the revelation, that gives credence to the response that was given. Let me walk around the text this morning if I can. In Isaiah chapter 7, we see King Ahaz. And King Ahaz is about ready to go into battle, and he calls together a wicked allegiance because King Ahaz himself is a wicked king. And so now he has a wicked allegiance and he's getting ready to go into battles against the enemies of God. And God says to him, you don't have to call anybody else to fight with you. I will fight your battle and I will take care of your situation. And if you need a sign, I will give you a sign. But Ahaz, he kind of got the cart before the horse. He, he kind of runs ahead of God, and he forms this wicked collusion to go into battle. But God gives him a sign nonetheless. And he says, this is the sign that you'll receive that I'm on your side. A virgin shall bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. A virgin shall bring forth a son. I, I want you to feel the weight of that for a moment. A virgin will bring forth a son. That's the prophecy that is being brought forth in Isaiah chapter 7. That prophecy meets its fulfillment in Matthew chapter 1 because there is a young virgin, a peasant girl, a young teenager by the name of Mary who is espoused or betrothed to a young man named Joseph. Now, this situation of betrothal needs to be unpacked just a little bit so you can understand what Joseph went through to do what God told him to do. The marriage, <clears throat> the marriage in the Bible days in Jewish custom was in three stages. Cust- uh, stage number one, there was first of all the engagement. It was an arranged marriage. Everybody say arranged. It was an arranged marriage by parents. Uh, Even when the kids were were young, it was an arranged marriage. Uh, They would find this person, this person. They'd say, hey, I I think uh, our kids would be a good match. I think I could be down with that. I think uh, think I could almost agree with arranged marriages. Some of y'all looking at me like a cow looking at a new gate today. I think I could almost be down with arranged marriages. You're looking at me like I'm crazy. Let me, let me tell you something. The Jews were careful not to bring bad blood into their family. I'm with that. Keep all them crazy folks and hoodlums and all of this out of your bloodline. Uh, that's a third of you. Amen. <clears throat> make sure that girl, make sure that boy is somebody that you want to look across the Thanksgiving table at. Make sure you don't get any bad blood in your family. See how quiet y'all got there? Uh, Our culture, listen, listen, I know that, you know, this ain't what you come to hear today, but this is what you got, so deal with it. Uh, Our our culture is the only culture that let our children hook up with anything. Uh, Rewind, press play. Our culture is the only, this Western culture is the only culture that let our children hook up with anything and everything. I I don't have time to talk about that, but that's the truth. But I don't have time to get into that. It was an arranged engagement. And then the betrothal lasted for about a year. The betrothal was much like uh, a marriage in so much as it was a legal contract. 
There was a, a dowry exchange. The bride's family gave something to the groom's family, and the groom's family gave something to the bride's family as a guarantee that this person would be the intended wife or the intended husband. The betrothal was a legal contract, and it, it could only be broken uh, by divorce. Even though they were not married, it could only be broken by divorce. He had to give her a bill of divorcement, even in the betrothal, and yet they had not even gotten married. And the last stage was the marriage itself. The marriage, the ceremony, the reception lasted two weeks. Look at your neighbor and say, what a party it must have been. Lasted two weeks, the marriage ceremony. It was a huge affair. They threw a lavish party, and the bride and the groom, after the ceremony, they went into a room that had already been prepared for them, and the bride and the groom, they got down on their knees, and they prayed together. Would to God, before marriages were consummated, that the bride and the groom would get down on their hands and knees and ask God to bless their union. Somebody ought to say amen to that here today. And then when they had consummated the marriage, they brought out a blood-stained sheet to show the family that the girl who had just married was indeed a virgin. But that's not the case with Mary and Joseph because by the time they get to that point, Mary is already four months pregnant. The Bible says she was a spouse to Joseph. She's found with child of the Holy Ghost. Now, it's already been revealed by, uh, to Mary by Gabriel and her cousin Elizabeth that what is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost, but Joseph can't handle that. How do you know Joseph can't handle that? Because Joseph is, is brokenhearted, he's betrothed, uh, is now pregnant before they consummate the union, and then she expects him to believe that the baby she's carrying is from the Holy Ghost? The story is incredible. And honestly, a little unbelievable in that this pure, sweet, innocent peasant girl named Mary expects Joseph to believe that she's pregnant without a man? That's impossible. You can't be pregnant without a man. But Gabriel has already made the announcement, and while Joseph is thinking about what to do with Mary, he goes to her cousin Elizabeth's house. She goes to her cousin Elizabeth's house, and she lives there three months. And the Bible says when Mary and Elizabeth greet one another, that the baby that is in Elizabeth's womb, who is the forerunner of the Christ, leaps and jumps and shouts in his mother's womb because he knows who Jesus is even prior to his birth. And then Mary begins to sing her Magnificat, my soul doth magnify the Lord. And when God gets ready to burst something through you, your soul ought to magnify the Lord. Amen? Well, somebody give God some good praise in here right now. I wish there was somebody in here this morning who's not afraid to let God use you even when the situation seems impossible. You're not afraid to put yourself in God's hands even when other folks say it cannot be done. Well, she's three months at Elizabeth's house, and while Joseph is trying to decide how to handle the situation, uh, because legally she could be stoned, she, she's been an embarrassment to the groom. He, he should not only divorce her, but he should turn her over to the courts, to the religious authorities who have the right and an obligation to stone her. But the Bible says that Joseph was a just man, a righteous man, and he wants to save his reputation. Let me rewind that. He wants to save his reputation as as well as Mary's life. So he decides to privately put her away because the Bible doesn't say that divorce has to be public. It ain't nobody else's business but his and Mary's and he can privately put her away and nobody would be the wiser and she would not have to be stoned. Let me just give you a little sidebar here. You know, the, the scripture says, while he thought on these things, let me give you a little sidebar while he's thinking on these things, you, you ought to never make a decision until you meditate on it. A whole lot of mistakes that we make in this life is because we don't take time to meditate on it. We don't take time to seek God. We don't take time to get godly wisdom, godly counsel. We want to listen to ungodly friends down at the beauty shop, down to the homeboys at the club. Listen, you ought to seek godly wisdom before you make any important decision in your life. He wants to put her away, but then the angel of the Lord comes up. And I imagine it's Gabriel again because Gabriel is God's messenger. Michael is an archangel, and he's a fighting prince. He only shows up 
and uh, wh- whenever there's trouble, and he's going to fight. When Michael shows up, you know, you know, cities are destroyed. Michael shows up, you know, the terrible calamities happen. When God gets ready to send judgment, he always calls on Michael to tear things up. Michael takes no prisoners. Amen. Michael tears up everything when he shows up. But Gabriel is an announcing angel, a messaging angel. And he, he comes with a message of glad tidings. And he always comes with, message, with a message of good news. And then he says, Joseph... Son of David. Now, if you'll look in your Bibles, you'll find out that nobody is called son of David except Joseph and Jesus Christ. But Joseph is such a good man. He's called the son of David. Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. Don't be scared to take Mary as your wife. She's not been found out. She's been discovered. Because there's a difference between being discovered and being found out. Help me while I preach here a little bit. You didn't find out she was pregnant. You discovered it because the Holy Ghost revealed it. You see, when you're found out, it's usually because of a sin situation. But when you're discovered, that's the Holy Ghost letting the cream rise to the top. Uh, What I'm trying to say is if God is working with you and in you, and if God's got his hand on you, you don't have to worry about anybody finding out. God will allow you to be discovered. If you can sing, God will let somebody know that that, that, that you can sing. If you've been called to preach, uh, you're not the only one who's going to know it. God will let somebody else know it. If you're a Christian, God will show enough let people discover because a tree is known by the fruit that it bears. Oh, I wish somebody would shout amen in here today. Amen. Am I doing okay? She hasn't been found out, which means she hasn't been lying to you. She hasn't been cheating on you, Joseph. She hasn't been with another man. Uh, What is in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth. That's going back to the prophecy in Isaiah. A son, and you shall call his name Jesus. This fulfillment of prophecy is talking about Jesus' unique personality. Wish you would help me preach right through here. Uh, There is nobody like Jesus. There is nobody like Jesus. That's four or five of you. There's nobody like Jesus. Would you help me here? I mean, there is nobody like Jesus. Really, that's the sermon. That's really all I'm trying to tell you today is there's nobody like Jesus. There's none like him. All the rest of this stuff is just to support what I just said. There is nobody like Jesus. There is nobody, no one, nowhere, nobody like him. He is in a class all by himself. He is the excellent representation of the fullness of the Godhead bodily. He is the perfect son of God. He is the perfect icon of God the Father. He is the exact representation of God in the flesh. He is the word that became flesh. And you see, there were those who came preparing the way for him, but they were not unique like him. They were good, but they were not God's best. Adam was a good man, but he was not God's best. Noah was a good man, but he was not God's best. Moses was good. David was good. Abraham was good. Isaac was good. Jacob was good. Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Amos, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Zechariah, Obadiah, Malachi, all of them were good men, but they were just prophets. But when you read the book of Hebrews, the writer says, in sundry times and in divers places, God spoke to us through prophets and prophecy, but now he has spoken to us through his son. Not just any son, but a uniquely born son, and his name is Jesus. Oh, would to God somebody would bless him in this house today. Now watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this. Isaac is the uniquely born son of Abraham, for Sarah is barren, but the difference is, is is Sarah, who is barren, has had sexual relations. She's barren. She knew her husband Abraham sexually, but Isaac is unique in the fact that he is born when Sarah is postmenopausal. She is postmenopausal. She's an octogenarian getting ready to give birth at almost 90 years old. A nonagenarian. That's unique and unusual, but, but nothing is impossible with God. 
Isaac is unique in the fact that his mother is way past her childbearing years. But nothing is impossible with God. But Mary has never had sexual relations. She never knew a man intimately. <clears throat> she is still a virgin, but she's pregnant. Isaac is unique, but Jesus was impossible unless God had his hand in it. Let me detour. The reason why some of you can't give God glory is because your situation uh, hasn't gotten desperate enough yet. It hasn't gotten dark enough. You haven't gotten pitiful enough. In your life, you're still trying to handle it all on your own. But when it gets to the point that the only way you can come out of it is that God has to have a hand in it, then that'll get a hallelujah out of you. Oh, somebody bless him. Anybody got a kid in here you can't do nothing with? Don't raise your hand. That's rhetorical. That's just preaching stuff right there. Say that hundred hands go up. Uh, anybody in here got a kid you can't do nothing with and you put him in the Lord's hands? And God straightened him out? Anybody in here ever had a situation that seemed like that you couldn't wrap your hands around, wrap your head around? Then you turned it over to the Lord and went to bed, got a good night's sleep. And when you woke up the next morning, the problem may have still been there, but God got in it with you and now you're able to handle it. You can face your tomorrow. You can face your difficulty because until God puts his hand on it, nothing is going to happen. You see, for everything that we encounter in life, we've got to get God in the center of it all. If you're with Pastor, would you shout amen? He has a unique personality. He's unique in the fact that he's born of a virgin. The angel says to Joseph, don't be scared to take Mary for your wife. She's not been cheating on you. She's not been lying to you. What she's conceived is of the Holy Ghost. You shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. His personality is that he is born uniquely in that his mother has never known a man sexually. Why is that important, Pastor? Well, I'll tell you why. Because if Jesus had been born of Joseph's seed... He would be just another man, but he's not just another man. He is humanity and divinity in equal parts. That's the, what theologians call the hypostatic union of God and man. Jesus is not 50% man and 50% God. Oh, no. He is 100% God and 100% man. He's not half God and half man. He is all man and all God because had he have been Joseph's son, his blood would have been tainted and his dying on the cross would have been of none effect. But because the blood came from his father, he shed his blood for your sin. And he shed his blood for my sin. And it was, uh, it was uh, the, the satisfaction of sin for my salvation because he did not know the bloodline of an earthly father. And so when he died, the veil in the temple was rent from top to bottom, uh, knocking out forever the intermediary between God and man. Remember how in the Old Testament they would sprinkle the blood of a goat on a mercy seat and then they would turn another goat loose in the wilderness and he would become the scapegoat but when Jesus died on the cross there's no need for a scapegoat there's no need for a high priest to go behind the veil in the temple in the holy of holies because his blood satisfied it all his blood was applied and that was applied when it was applied for my uh, the satisfaction of the payment of my sin and your sin great God what can wash away my sin nothing but the blood of Jesus what can make me whole again, nothing but the blood of Jesus. He was unique in his personality. He was unique in his purpose. He came to save me from my sin. If we had needed an education, God would have sent us a philosopher. If we'd have needed money, he would have sent us an economist. But because we were lost and on our way to hell, God sent us a savior. And that Savior is Jesus Christ. Oh, somebody bless him right now. Would you do that? Amen. And as much as I'd like to stay right there, I need to cut across the field and bring this on home today. He has a unique personality, has a unique purpose. 
He has unique power. Not only is his name Jesus, but his name is Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. There's just something about the name of Jesus. Brothers and sisters, if I write you a check for a million dollars and sign my name to the bottom of it, don't cash it. I'm not worth a million dollars. I'm not worth a thousand dollars. Some of you all don't think I'm worth a dime. (laughs) Pause and let that sink in there just for a moment. But if I write you a check for a million dollars, don't cash it. Because the name, the signature, does not bear the authority of that amount. But if Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, part of that Kennedy crew, write you a check for a million dollars, go to the bank with confidence. Because there's something about the name Gates and Buffett that's different than the name of Sexton. If you're tracking with me, say amen. Amen. Gates, Buffett, Kennedy, those names smell of money. I sign my name, they sign their name. The difference is, whose name? Well, there's another name. There's another name that at the calling of that name, sick people get well. I wish I had some noise up in here today. At the sound of that name, dead people start walking. At the sound of that name, bad people become good people. At the sound of that name, folks on their way to hell turn it around and start walking toward heaven. There is a name I love to hear. I love to sing its worth. It sounds like music to my ears, the sweetest name on earth. It tells me of my Savior's love who died to set me free. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. If you love him today, would you bless him? I love to call on his name. It's a beautiful name. It feels good just rolling off your tongue, Jesus. Say it with me, would you? Jesus. Jesus. That name soothes your sorrows. How sweet the name Jesus sounds in every believer's ear. His name ought to soothe. It ought to soothe your sorrows, heal your wounds, drive away your fears. Have you ever been in a dark place in your life and you called on the name of Jesus? I promise you it'll brighten it up a dark room. When life gets real testy in some of the situations that get around you and get out of your control, how many of you know that you just can't control everything? All you can control is you. I said, you can't control anything, everybody, and everything that happens around you. All you can control is you. Can somebody shout amen? Amen. Say, oh, no, I can control that situation. No, you can't. You can only control you. But when your life gets real testy and situations get out of control, there's a name that will lift up your bowed down head. There's a name that will cheer your wounded spirit. There's a name that will make you happy in the midnight hour. Wish somebody would help me preach today. There is a name that will do no matter... uh, There's a name that will do what other names will not do. There's power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There's healing in the name of Jesus. There's joy in the name of Jesus. There's salvation in the name of Jesus. How sweet the name of Jesus. It's the sweetest name that I know. When I'm in trouble, I'll call upon that name. When I was sick and could not get well, I called upon that name. When I was in sin and ashamed of what I had done, I called upon that name. When my enemies were lining up behind my back, 
I called upon the name. When my mother and father left me for glory, I called upon the name of Jesus. When nobody's around to help me in the middle of my struggle, I still call upon that name. Is there anybody in here today that knows that there is power in the name of Jesus? Jesus. Well, I don't know if I believe that. I dare you to call on his name right now. Call on him for your sickness. Call on him for your wayward spouse. Call, call on him for that wayward son or daughter. Call, call on him for that crazy in-law of yours. Call, call on him for that boy and that girl that won't listen to you. Call on him for the trouble that just won't get out of your way. And when Jesus shows up, he has unique power. He went to a wedding feast in Cana of Galilee. He turned water into wine. He went to Jairus' house, raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. Woman with an issue of blood grabbed his clothes. She was made whole. But we don't have to go to Jairus' house. We don't have to go to a wedding feast. But there is somebody here right now who can say, Brother Pastor, I've called upon his name before, and calling upon his name made the difference in my life. Who am I preaching to right now? If the Lord's been good to you, why don't you give him praise? Amen. If the name of Jesus ever got you out of your depression, why don't you give him praise? If the name of Jesus ever sounded you out of your misery, why don't you give him praise? If the name of Jesus ever just made you happy to hear it, why don't you give him praise? Why don't you help me testify that the name of Jesus, there is power in the name of Jesus. I'm closing. Power in the name. Say it with me, Jesus. Say it again, Jesus. I love that name. There's no other name given among men whereby we must be saved except the name of Jesus. There really is something about his name. Would you bow your head? Father, I bless you today. There is something wonderful. Something glorious about the name of Jesus. Mary was going to bring forth a son. Going to call him Jesus. Emmanuel, God with us. He's going to save his people from their sins. Power in the name of Jesus. This morning, if you're here, I don't know the struggle that you're going through. I may never know the struggle you're going through, but if you're here and you're going through a struggle today, one thing and one thing only, I promise you, that the power that is in the name of Jesus will make a difference in your situation. Calling upon the name of the Lord will make a difference in your situation. Just saying, Jesus, let me tell you, if you're here today and you don't have a real relationship with Jesus, it's just as easy as saying, Jesus, I'm a sinner. You're a savior. Will you save me? Jesus, will you save me? You see? And like that, he'll save you. It's as easy as saying, Lord, I'm going through this particular struggle. I'm having, I'm having these issues. I'm having this. I'm having this in my life. Father, I trust in the name of your son, Jesus. And I promise you this, that there's power in the name of Jesus. Who am I talking to right now? Who am I talking to? Who am I talking to? Who am I talking to? I'm going to pray a very short prayer. 
And if during that prayer, you need the Lord to do something wonderful and marvelous in your life, I'm just going to ask you to stand up where you're at and just make your way down here to this front area. I promise you, if you come, you won't be alone because I'll meet you there. And we're just going to call on the name of Jesus for you and believe Jesus to do what nobody else can do because there's power in his name. As I pray, would you come? Father, in Jesus' name. I preached just a short little simple sermon, God, on how there is power in the name of Jesus. Father, right now, as people are looking inwardly at their hearts, Father, some find themselves in situations they don't know how they're going to get themselves out of. But Father, I know it's Jesus. It's Jesus. Jesus in the morning. Jesus at noontime. Jesus when the sun goes down. There's power in the name of Jesus. And Father, right now, I just ask you to touch every person who is in need of the help of that name today. And I'll give you the praise for it in Jesus' name, in his precious, powerful name. All right. Now, those of you that are remaining, I want you to stand. Would you stand all across this building? And those of you that would, would you, some of you come down and just lay your hands on these people that are gathered here at this altar. And Pastor Scott and myself and some of the elders will make our way through and begin praying for these folks. There really is power in the name of Jesus. His name will do when no one else could do. Would you extend your hand this way now? For those of you that are remaining in your pew, would you extend your hand this way? And would you say, Father God, in the name of your son Jesus, would you touch every person at that altar area right now? Would you do that? Would you go ahead and whisper that prayer? Would you go ahead and pray that prayer right now? Father God, in the name of Jesus, touch every person there right now. Touch every person right now. In the mighty name of Jesus, in that powerful name of Jesus. Would you do that? Would you do that? Would you do that, Father, in the name of Jesus, for every person that has come to this altar today? I do not know their situation. Do not know what they're walking through, what they're going through. But I do know this, that there's power in the name of Jesus. And the name of Jesus will do in their life what nothing else can do. And, Father, we bless you for that. We give you praise for that. We give you glory and honor for that right now in the name of your son, Jesus. So, Father, right now, begin to touch every heart. Touch every life. Heal every heart. Begin to apply that balm of Gilead to every person that needs your touch in the powerful, mighty name of Jesus.